What's heaven gonna be like? I don't know yet. We've never been there. What do you think it'll be like? The streets are made out of gold. And it's really bright. The angels. Giraffes. Giraffes are in the boat. Oh, they're in a boat. Okay. What color boat is it? Baby red. Bears. There's dogs in heaven, but there's probably not cats. There's lots of buildings. Really tall ones? Yeah. Like really, really tall? Yeah. There's gold everywhere. I think it has sand in a beach. Do you think there are sharks in heaven? No. Starfish? No, I hate starfish. <laughs> the trees should be green. Or the trees could be gold. There's no death, pain, sickness, or any of that bad stuff. Probably with ballerinas and statues of angels. What about the Statue of Liberty? Would it be there? Mm, yes. What else do you see? Basketball hoop. Basketball hoop? Well, good morning. Let me invite you to take your Bibles, turn me in the New Testament to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. And we continue our series this morning, uh, obviously on the subject of heaven. Series we began last weekend, and we'll pick up this morning. As you're making your way to our passage where we'll anchor down this morning, I want to remind, uh, remind us that this afternoon at 4 p.m. in room 228, uh, we're hosting Philip Blinson with Families for Families. Uh, Philip and Families for Families were with us three weeks ago when we spoke on the matter of foster family, foster ministry, in terms of serving and helping uh, foster families. And so Philip will be with us this afternoon for an informational session. So uh, not asking you to sign your life away, just asking you to come and learn some information and just say, hey, you know what, I, th I think maybe supporting and helping foster families is a ministry area where I or our family or maybe your community group, uh, also uh, several of our ministry teams, the work that your ministry team does uh, would fit very well into this ministry of supporting uh, foster families. So just come this afternoon, 4 o'clock, room 228, gather the information, and let's just take a step forward together in that, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, series on heaven. Uh, how many of you would like a good road trip? Yes, all right. For the rest of you, get on board. Let's go. Road trips are fun, all right? But a road trip eventually leads to some degree of being homesick, right? I mean, even, even for those of us that like to travel, uh, and don't mind being away, at some point you, you come to the point of saying, you know what, I'm just ready to be home, right? I want to sleep in my bed tonight, right? And so there is this sense of, of kind of being homesick. In high school, the summer before my junior year of high school, I spent two weeks as an exchange student in Japan. And, uh, man, we had a blast. For a little over two weeks, we, we had a blast. And the night before we were to fly home, our counterparts, the Japanese students uh, of the families that were hosting us, they took the American students out for uh, just kind of a, a last night, right? A lot of fun. And uh, somehow we wound up in a karaoke place. Don't ask me how. It's really not important to your life. But uh, we wound up in this uh, karaoke spot. And so, I mean, we're just singing all these tunes. And the next thing I know, they handed me the mic and it punched up. And I am singing along Ray Charles, Georgia on my mind. And the next thing I know, seven American students, we are all bawling our eyes out like babies, right? I mean, a night of excitement and fun turned into, oh, mama, mama. I mean, like, we, you know, we were just like ready to be home. I think just kind of the overwhelmingness of it. We'd had a good time. Right, but I was ready to be somewhere where I could read and understand the billboards and where I understood that everybody around me was saying, you know, and um, I wanted to eat food that was kind of prepared the way that, 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 that I was used to being prepared. And so I was just homesick, 
right? I want to sleep in my bed, and I, I ain't going to lie to you, I want to see my mama, I want to see my dad, right? And so now I'm the, I'm the student that was on the trip that after about three days, the chaperone, uh, Danny Bessinger, said to me that morning, he goes, hey, I need you to call your mama. And I was like, what? He goes, uh, apparently you haven't called home. You're the only one that hadn't called home to let her know that you're okay. And she has sent word through other families to their students that she'd like to hear from you. So for the love of Pete, would you call your mother? And so, um, so listen, I want to close the loop on that because some of you will be like, well, did you call your mama? I did. She's fine. We're good, right? We're good. She just needed to hear from her favorite child, and she was good. Spiritually, you know, we, we long for eternity. There is in us a longing for heaven. I mean, I think that's part of what it means to be created in the image of God, is that God has stamped upon our souls eternity. And there is a part of us that, that longs for that. And heaven is the fulfillment of God's promise for us for eternity. And so pick up with me in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 35. The Apostle Paul writes, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have when they come? You fool, Paul says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you're not sowing the body that will be, but only a seed, perhaps of wheat or another grain. But God gives it a body as he wants, and to each of the seeds its own body. Not all flesh is the same flesh. There is one flesh for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is different from that of the earthly ones. There is a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, and another of the stars. In fact, one star differs from another star in splendor. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. We sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from earth, there's Adam, a man of the dust. The second man, which is a reference to Jesus, is from heaven. And like the man of the dust, so are those who are of the dust. And like the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, euphemism for death, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. And when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Paul says, in light of all that and a whole lot more, right? Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for your truth. Thank you, Lord, for stamping eternity upon our hearts. And Father, thank you for giving us eternal life through repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ who has paved the way for us. So God, this morning, would you convict by the truth of eternity and would you comfort us by the truth of eternity. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Here's the big idea out of what Paul's teaching us here in these verses. Heaven gives us confidence in the greater power and purposes of God. Heaven gives us a confidence in the greater power and purposes of God. Here in our passage in 1 Corinthians 15, there are bookends in this passage. Verse 35 on one end and verse 58 on the other. Verse 35 raises the questions, right? Paul says, now some will ask, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body will they have? I mean, is that not the questions that we want to know? How's this thing going to work? How's God going to do it? What am I going to look like? What kind of body am I going to have, right? We want to know those questions. Then on the other end is verse 58. 
where Paul says, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, right? Verse 58 is the bookend that tells us that no matter what the cost in this life, you can count on the ultimate triumph of God's purposes. Joni Erickson Tata, paraplegic herself, wrote, trying to understand what our bodies will be like in heaven is much like expecting an acorn to understand its destiny of roots, barks, branches, and leaves. So we sense it and we feel it, right? This body is wearing out. It's wearing down. And we think, I, I'm going to need something different. I'm going to need something new, right? I'm going to need something for eternity. And that's the question that the Corinthians had. And Paul addressed her, right? He said, some of you are asking, how will the dead be raised? And what kind of body are we going to have? And so we sense that there needs to be something new. Throughout the scriptures, God promises of a new heaven and a new earth, right? We are looking forward to eternity and we're looking forward to what it is that God will do. And I've listed the scriptures there that you can jot down and go back and read those later. But throughout scripture, God promises of this new heaven and this new earth. And so as we read through the scriptures and as we read through the story of redemptive history and we see what God is doing and where he's moving it, it all prepares us for when we get to the end of the story in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, right? And after, at that time, we, we see that after Jesus' return and after the final defeat of our enemy Satan and after the judgment of non-believers, John describes the scene when he says in Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2, John says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And so by the time we get to the end of recorded Revelation, right, for us here in the Bible, we are prepared, like we're not surprised that John would see a new heaven and a new earth because that's what God has been preparing us to expect. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And we get excited, right? The new heaven and the new earth and eternity, and this is all going to be gloriously good. And so he speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. In the New Testament, the, the language that the New Testament was written in is Greek, Koine Greek. There are two words that are translated for new. The, the first of those words is in reference to time, right? This, is, this happened, then this, this is new. And so in reference to time. The second word that's translated is in reference to quality, right? This is newer than that, right? So it's kind of like the new car smell new pair of shoes, all right? So new in terms of quality. And that is the word, the word for new that refers to a quality of, ex of existence that is translated in the book of Revelation. So the Bible tells us there that we will have a new name. We will sing a new song. We will live in the new Jerusalem. We will possess and enjoy new things. We will dwell in a new heaven and a new earth. It will be qualitatively different it will be qualitatively superior to anything that we have seen or experienced. As a matter of fact, the word does not refer to annihilation, but rather to recreation or redemption. So the, the Lord, Jesus himself, will create the new heaven and the new earth by renovating, overhauling, refurbishing, reconstituting the old heaven and the old earth. Matter of fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, in verses 10 and 12, it says that, that this heaven and earth will be burned up. Not burned up in the sense of consumed and destroyed to ash, but burned in the sense of purged, cleansed, cleaned. And so the Lord Jesus will purge heaven and earth and will present uh, heaven and earth as cleansed and glorified for eternal use. It is really hard to think of something and to understand something that we've never seen, right? And that we, we, we don't have a point of comparison. And so when we think about heaven, it's probably easier and maybe more helpful for us to think of the things that will not be there. Uh, as I think about heaven and I think about eternity, here's what pictures in my mind. When I read the scriptures of a new heaven and a new earth, I think about a return to the Garden of Eden. 
right? Uh, perfection being restored. Going back to God's original plan and design and creation and that God recreates, right? Recreates heaven and earth without all of those things that we talked about last week, without sin, without separation, without destruction, without disease, without all of that. And so next week we're going to deal primarily with the question of what will we do in heaven because some of you are really really concerned about that you're afraid you're going to be bored so we'll deal with that question next week but this morning we want to deal with the idea of what kind of body are we going to get right because what's this new what we call a glorified body going to be like because some of you are thinking as you look at yourself in the mirror you're like is this it like i mean <laughs> this is so let's see what the bible tells us in our passage, there are two uh, principles here, two truths, I should say, about our glorified bodies that we can know. The first is this. Our glorified bodies in heaven will be real. Will be real. I think some people have this idea that somehow our, our resurrected glorified body is to be like an apparition, you know, like a, like a ghost, just kind of you know, floating around, disembodied in some way. Now, I'm going to date myself just a little bit here. Uh, after school, when I was a kid, we'd get home, and uh, there were two cartoons that we'd watch. Uh, it was the Flintstones. Thank you. It was the Flintstones and Scooby-Doo. Now, I don't mean Scooby-Doo like the new adventures of, you know, Scrappy or Scruffy or whoever the little puppy is. I'm talking about like the original, like, over here, you know, Shaggy. I'm talking about like the real Scooby-Doo, Okay. You know, and it'd always be the bad guy was always a, a ghost of some sense, right? And so, uh, and they would just kind of float around. And so I think in our minds, we have this idea of, of, of that is what our experience will be. Eh, wrong. Our glorified bodies will be real. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul uses nature and agricultural imagery to prepare us for the real, reality of a real human body. You know, we saw this last week as we referenced this passage that Paul says, you know, you sow a seed and you sow a seed in the ground and that seed dies and out of the depth of that seed comes a new plant. And so nature prepares us to accept the reality that life follows death. And so Paul uses this imagery and just like you would bury a seed in the ground that would then sprout a plant, the body is going to be sown, is going to be buried into the ground. And so if you plant a garden, and hopefully none of you made the mistake of planting anything before Easter here in Georgia, right? Because you knew that it was going to get cold again and you know it's coming, so now you can prepare. But when you plant a garden, you're going to toss some seeds. Let's just take corn for instance, right? You take that corn seed, you place it in the dirt, you cover it up, and then in time, it comes up out of the ground. And when it comes up out of the ground, it's still corn, right? It'll be the same essence. But what comes up out of the ground is not that little seed, right? You planted the corn seed, and out of that seed comes a what? A stalk, right? And so what comes out of the ground is not a kernel, but the whole stalk. What comes out of the ground is bigger, better, and more impressive than that which was sown into the ground in the seed. And so that's what Paul says. In the same way, when we die, our bodies will be sown into the dirt. And in the same way, at the resurrection, we will come up, right, out of the ground. We will still be human. We will still be real. But what emerges, what is resurrected, will be superior to what was to the old body. So our glorified bodies will be real. It, the Bible speaks to what I call the continuity of life. You know that when we die, we do not become ghosts or apparitions of some sort, right? But there's this continuity of life from earth to eternity. And so we want to know well, what we're going to look like, right? What's, what's, what's this glorified body going to be? The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 3, and verse 2, really summarizes it and puts it all into the, the simplest statement. He says, dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, say it with me, we will be like him. 
Now, in essence, we should be able to put a period there, sing a song, and go home. I just don't want you to feel like you got shortchanged, so I'm going to say a few more things about it, all right? We will be like him because we will see him as he is. If we want to know what our experience and what it is going to be like in a resurrected way, we have to look no further than the resurrected Lord Jesus himself, right? So the example for us of what we will be like is the resurrected, glorified life and body of Jesus. He was a real, physical person. As a matter of fact, you read at the first of, uh, of 1 Corinthians 15, it says that he, what, he appeared to his disciples. The Bible tells us here that he appeared to more than 500. So there were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Lord Jesus. Matter of fact, John, in 1 John chapter 1, he says, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, and that which we uh, have known, we testify to you. And so the resurrected Lord Jesus was seen. He was also touched. Jesus gives testimony to his real body. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears to his disciples after he's resurrected. And what does he say? He says, look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see that I have. So even Jesus gave testimony to the fact that his resurrected body was a real body, and so we will be like him, so therefore we will have a real body. Jesus was real. He was human, and we too as well. Now listen, that makes this reunion all that much sweeter. I mean, think about it. last week, one of the things we, we talked about that one of the things we anticipate and should in heaven is a reunion of some sort, right? That there are loved ones, family, friends, people that, were, that, that have been in our life that are believers that have died, that have passed from this life into eternity. And so we expect to see them again. So one of the comforting aspects of eternity in heaven is this family reunion aspect. I mean, think about it. What's better in a reunion than in being able to, to give each other a hug? I mean, when I returned from Japan, I ain't gonna lie to you, I missed my mama. I was 16 at the time. I reasoned like a child. Now i grown up. But I, I did. I, I missed my, like I hadn't seen them. Now, I did talk to them on the phone. I mean, like I told you, I did eventually call her and be like, hey, I'm good, having a great time, see you later, you know. But when I got home, I walked off the plane, I wanted a, a hug. There was a reunion, right? We have that sense in, in, in our own lives. When we haven't seen someone, when we've been apart for a while, to be reunited. I mean, think about it. To have a real glorified but real human body and in that reunion to be able to hug and to embrace. Not only that, to be able to embrace our Lord Jesus. I mean, part of the way that God created us is with our senses of taste and smell and hearing and touch and sight. Now listen, in this life, it is real, it is true. We do not all experience or have all of those senses to the same degree. Some people are born without uh, the ability to see. Some people become, uh, lose sight through life, right? People are born without the ability to hear or maybe over time loss of hearing. You lose your sense of taste. But God created us with these senses to be able to what? To be able to enjoy the creation around us. To be able to smell and touch and see and enjoy. And so listen, when we get to heaven, we shouldn't ex expect to experience less, but rather we should expect to experience it more. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.9 that... that, that uh, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has concealed, God has prepared these things for those who love him. That heaven will be what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or imagine or think. And so to be able to enjoy heaven and eternity would be to have those senses and those sensory experiences. Now Paul says in verse 35, what kind of body will they have when they come? And so one of the questions that we like to ask is, what about the aging process? Like, how old am I going to look in heaven? How, how old, am, you know, will it be? I mean, if, if I'm 45, if, if, if I, is, is 45 
that my look at 45, is that my look for eternity? And people ask questions about, well, what about, you know, babies and, and children who die uh, before or during, during, uh, before and, and as young, right? What about those that live a lot longer than the rest of us? You know, what, what, are, what are they going to look like? I have no clue. <laughs> That's where we'll put the period in the end to go home. No, I'm just I, I, honestly, I don't know. I, don't, I don't even have a good guess of how God's going to work that out. So it leads to the, to the next question is, well, then will we recognize each other? Like, how would this reunion aspect happen? I mean, am I going to know you? You know, are you going to know me? How are we going to, to know each other? Will we recognize each other? And I would say, yes, we will recognize each other in, a, in an intuitive sense. And so let me see if I can explain this. I mean, for instance, how will we recognize each other? I would like to think that God will restore my brushable wave in the wind hair. Some of you don't know that that was a part of my life at one time. Matter of fact, uh, of our four children, I think our daughter, who's 21, I think she's the only one that probably has any memory whatsoever of dad having any kind of, of brushable hair. I mean, my boys have only known, known me, you know, in the present state, at least here. And so, uh, sure enough, mine and Trisha's wedding portrait in a previous home where we lived uh, years ago, mine and Trisha's wedding portrait hung at the end of the hallway uh, on the, where the bedrooms were at. And Landon, our, our eldest son, uh, he, said, he asked this question. This, the, the, the picture had to come down. He said, why is Uncle Matthew in that picture with Mom? That is not your uncle, that is your father. I used to brush my hair. So how will we recognize one another? Intuitively. I mean, think about it. Jesus appeared to Mary. Jesus was recognized by Mary, not by the way he looked. By what? His voice, the way he said her name. He was recognized by the disciples on the road to Emmaus, not by how he looked, but how? By the way he said a blessing, by the way he prayed. I mean, think about it. We know each other. I mean, listen, like, we run into, the heaven, into each other in heaven and God has restored my hair. I don't want you to be confused. You'd be like, ah, no, it doesn't look like him at all, you know? Or you'd be like, you know what, if you, I think if you cover up the hair, yep, I can see it now. No, I think intuitively there will be just like we know people in this way now. Think about it. There are some people that when you think of them, you see their smile, right? You see their, their face. Their facial features, okay? And, you know, if you were to cover up everything except their smile, you'd be able to pick out your loved one or your friend out of a lineup because you would recognize them in that way, right? There are catchphrases that we say. There are colloquial phrases that we say. You all know I talk with my hands, and so, you know, you might not recognize anything else. You go, but listen, I recognize that voice in those hands. That's the preacher, right? And so uh, there I'd just be Michael, so let's just call it that. But this sense of, of recognizing I mean, the way that we stand, even when you're looking out across a parking lot or across or uh, down a hallway, you might not be able to see their face and make out the facial features, but by the way that a person walks, you recognize, you go, oh yeah, I'd recognize that walk anywhere, right? If you've got multiple children or grandchildren, you learn to recognize the pitter-patter of their feet coming down the hallway, Right? You, can, you know who it is that's coming down the steps or coming down the hallway. You know who it is got out of their bed when they're supposed to not be out of their bed by the sound of their feet because there's always the one that learned to tiptoe and be soft, and then there's the one that hadn't got a clue how to do anything quietly, and it's just clum, clum, clum coming down the hallway, right? We recognize the difference, and so there is this intuitive understanding that we'll have. So whatever we look like, Yes, Scripture makes it clear that we will recognize. Jesus was recognized, so therefore we should rest comforted that we would recognize one another. Which leads to the question about marriage. Will, will our marriage or will marriage remain intact in heaven? In Matthew chapter 22, the Sadducees come to Jesus and are seeking to kind of, well, not, they're not seeking kind of, they are, they want to trap him. And so... 
in Matthew 22, beginning of verse 23, it says, That same day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came up to him and questioned him. Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother is to marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us, and the first got married and died having no offspring. He left his wife to his brother. And the same thing happened to the second also and the third and so on to all seven. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection then, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had married her. Now, the Sadducees are referring to what's known as the Leverite marriage, in which the closest male relation of a man who died was required to marry his brother's widow and then to father and to raise children as if they were his own. And so the Sadducees use this example here, right? And they go, there were seven brothers, one got married, died right all the way down, and so all seven of these brothers were married to this lady by the law. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be because they were all married to her? Now, Jesus went on, right? He went on, look back in Matthew 22. Jesus went on in verse 29, and he answered them. You are mistaken because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels. Now, some of you are like, preacher, you told us last week that we don't become angels. He didn't say you become angels. He said it would be like in terms of the experience in heaven. And so Jesus said, you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. And so he says that in heaven, we would be like angels, neither given nor giving in marriage. Now, angels are created beings as well. They're, they're persons, but angels are not sexual beings like you and I are. They do not procreate. They do not share intimacy. And so what Jesus is saying is, neither will there be that in heaven. Marriage as a physical union is terminated with the death of one's spouse. That's what Paul wrote in first, excuse me, Romans 7, 1 through 3, and 1 Corinthians 7, 39, right? That that covenant relationship is broken only by death. And so Jesus and his bride are the ultimate marriage relationship in heaven. As a matter of fact, according to Ephesians chapter 5, the purpose of our earthly marriages is ultimately to do what? To reflect and to show the marriage relationship of Jesus, the bridegroom, with his bride, the church. And so this relationship between Jesus and the church, between the bride and the bridegroom, fulfills the purpose of earthly marriage and supersedes marriage in heaven. So listen, in heaven, even though husband and wife, I, I don't think, according to what Jesus said, would not be married, we will know and enjoy and appreciate each other deeper than we can know even in this life. It's what Jesus said to the Sadducees that day. He said, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God, right? It is hard for you and me to imagine what heaven will be like. It's hard for us to imagine the depth of the joy of heaven. So that's what Jesus said to them, say to us, we don't know the power of God. And so in this earth, our minds are limited. But first of all, we'll have a real human body and we really will recognize one another. The second truth this morning is this. Our glorified bodies will not only be real, but they'll be suitable for heaven. They'll be suitable for heaven. Verse 51, Paul says, listen, I am telling you a mystery. Now, when we hear the word mystery, we think of something that can't be known, right? I mean, it's a mystery. I don't know. Can't nobody understand. It's just a mystery, like unsolved mysteries or something. Like somehow you're not supposed to ever find out or know. That is not what the word that's translated for mystery in the New Testament means. It literally means something that was previously hidden something that was previously not understood that has now been made clear. The Apostle Paul used the same word in Ephesians 5 when he was describing marriage. He said what? He said, I'm speaking of a mystery, right? He said, the purpose of marriage was not fully revealed, but now through Jesus, that mystery has been made known. So it's the same thing here. He said, I'm speaking of a mystery. Previously, we didn't have a clue how this was going to happen. But now, through Jesus, it has been revealed to us what we will be like. And so, he says, I am telling you a mystery. 
And then guess what? He tells us the mystery. So it's not a mystery anymore. He says, listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Paul says, here's the mystery. The mystery is that we will be raised, resurrected bodily. We will be transformed. We will be human, but we will be different. We will be transformed for eternity. Paul says, the mystery is this. Not everybody's going to die, but all will be changed. To a real human body that will be different. Verses 42 through 44 here in 1 Corinthians 15 Paul then describes what that different body will be like. Look what he says. So it is with the resurrection of dead. It'll be sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. First of all, our bodies, according to Paul here, our bodies will be indestructible. He said that we are sown in corruption and raised in incorruption. Our eternal bodies, our glorified bodies will be indestructible, meaning there won't be this wearing out. Like, I feel it. Yard work over the weekend, I'm going to carry that one and I'm going to feel that one until about Wednesday at lunchtime this week. Y'all know what I'm saying? This thing is wearing out. I used to not feel that way. My mind tells me that I'm still that 16 to 18 year old kid who went to Japan and came home and no, 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 no. My, my 45 year old body is telling me that all those things when I did with 16, I'm feeling them now. Y'all know what I'm saying? This thing is wearing down. Paul says that corruptible body will be sown, but it will be raised incorruptible. It will be sown in weakness, right? Our, body, our resurrected glorified body will be incredible. Sown in weakness, but raised in power, not limited. It'll be infinite. He said it's so natural and it'll be raised spiritual. Verse 53, he says, For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, must put on incorruptibility, your translation may say. And this mortal body must be clothed, must put on immortality. And when this corruptible body has put on incorruptibility and when this mortal body has gotten dressed and put on Immortality for eternity, he says, then will come about the promise that is written. Paul says in verse 53 that we are going to put on a real body, but different. I mean, literally, verse 53, he says, Jesus, ha, when you're resurrected, Jesus will dress you for eternity. It will be suitable for heaven. So then it raises the question, when does all of this begin? And why do we fear death? When does it all begin and why do we fear death? As believers, as Christians, we live in a tension of what I call the not yet. We're not yet there, right? We're still living in this life and we're not yet home. And we live in that tension. The Apostle Paul even described it himself in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. He said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He goes on down, he says, but I'm hard pressed from both directions. He says, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. Paul said, I, I, I want to go to heaven. He said, but I'm, I'm hard pressed because I also desire to remain on in the flesh. I mean, that's the tension that exists for most of us, right? If you're a believer, I, I look forward to eternity in heaven. Some would say, I'm just not necessarily in a hurry. The reality is that we have to die in order to get to heaven. Now, granted, it is true that there will be one generation of believers that will be alive when Christ returns. So there is one generation that will skip out. And I know we're like, let it be us. I mean, if nothing else, how awesome and cool will that be? So there is one generation who will get to see the Lord return. And that generation will skip the dying part. But for the rest, 
Should the Lord delay in his return, we must all leave this life through the doorway of death. Now, most of us don't think about that, but here's the question. What will that moment be like? What will we experience in the transition from here to there? Derek, I'm going to be honest with you, I have probably hadn't thought a whole lot about that moment in my life. I mean, I think about eternity. I think about heaven. I understand that I will die. I've been to and conducted enough funerals. But I really hadn't thought about it until January the 3rd of this year. As I sat there with the paramedics in my face, with my heart literally out of control and them incapable of correcting it in that moment. And you think, because this is what I thought, is this it? Is, is this my appointed time? And then I thought, what's this going to feel like? Is this going to hurt? What am I going to experience? What am I about to see? These were the thoughts that were running through my head while also telling myself, breathe and stay calm. We try to avoid death. And that's, that ain't a bad thing. That's entirely normal. Scripture calls death our enemy, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Death was not what God wanted when he created Adam and Eve. Matter of fact, God warned Adam and Eve not to do the thing that would make them die. Death and dying are hard and ugly. It's hard and it's ugly. I think it's hard and ugly because it's really unnatural. It's not the way we were created to be. It's an intrusion. So the dilemma we find ourselves in is we don't want to die, but we do want to go to heaven. Or some would say if we could just all go at the same time. Death is our enemy, but Jesus is our friend. So we don't need to pretend that we look forward to death, but at the same time, friends, believers should not be afraid of death either. I mean, what will we experience? It's what Paul writes here at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. He says, in a moment, we'll be changed in this resurrection time. The word for moment there is where we get our English word atom, A-T-O-M. The smallest possible. Now listen, I realize in our time, a science now knows how to split an atom and to divide it. The Apostle Paul did not, they did not know how to split an atom at the time. So Paul is using a word that referred to the, the smallest amount of time possible. We might say it like this way. In a New York minute, we'll all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will all be changed Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory and where, O oh, death, is your sting? What will we experience? Paul calls it a victory. It's the Greek word Nike, of which we pronounce it Nike, and we splatter it all over clothes. The word literally means victory here. It literally means to conquer or to overcome. Paul says in our transition to heaven, we will conquer. We will overcome. So will it hurt? No. Preacher, how can you say it won't hurt? Because the sting of death has been removed. Death has nothing left to inflict upon us. So what will we feel? I believe the comforting presence of the Lord Jesus himself. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said, I'll take you to be with me so that where I am, there you will be also. The writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, verses 35 and 36 says, don't throw away your confidence, 
which has a great reward. For you need endurance so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what was promised. He said, don't throw away your confidence. When we face life and death, if we're not careful, we throw away our confidence. We stop looking at our resurrected Jesus and we start looking at the self. How many of you like to ride roller coasters? Okay. Lottie Dog, good for you. If I ever find myself snookered onto a roller coaster, I hold tightly to the handlebar. I figure it's attached to the unit, and if anything happens, I'm holding on for dear life, right? I mean, I jiggle the handlebar several times. I test it several times before the train leaves the station. And if for some reason I have a lapse of common sense while out there on the roller coaster track, and I raise my hands and go, Whoo! I always come back to the handlebar. It's not going anywhere. In life and in death, hold fast to the promises of God. In life and in death, hold tight to the promises of God. When you are scared, hold tight. When you're confused, hold tight. When you're grieving, hold tight. Hold tight to that which is anchored to eternity. And you can only hold tight to that which you have received. For if you have not received Jesus as your Savior, then you have not received the promises of God. And the need of your life this morning is to turn from doing your own thing, living a sinful, a life of disobedience to God, even though you may be a really good person, and to turn to Jesus, to cling and to hold fast. That's what Paul said, right? Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the hope that is real. We hold tight to the promises of God. Father in heaven, Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the gift of those all in your son, Jesus, who died, who's buried, and was raised again, who has paved the way for us. God, I pray for men, women, boys, and girls here this morning that they would turn from doing their own thing, living their own way, and turn and surrender faith to trust Jesus as their Savior. Father, would you help us not only to live out there holding fast to the promises, but God, would you help us to worship in here, here, in light of the steadfast promises you give us in Jesus' name.